gymnastics and they're never going to come to a conclusion. The reason why I couple this with a whole bunch of other things is they're all related to fundamentally the question, is Islam true? Because what's worse, having to die and possibly be tortured by your enemies or a man hitting his wife with a miswak, what's actually physically worse? Also, you know, you know. Okay, no, sorry, let me just answer this. What's actually worse? I mean, I just think those are very different circumstances that you can't, like... No, okay, what situation would you rather be in? I'm just talking about in terms of unfairness, because the root cause of these questions is there's something unfair in the... Are you guys sticking to... Uh, are you up to answer some more questions? Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Are you up to answer some more Can you answer some more questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm Amul, I'm his cousin. Um, I'm Muslim, obviously, but I just have some questions about Islam. Um, so, I think you probably get asked this often, but like, I've never had an explanation that makes sense to me. But in Surah Nisa, like, verse 34, when it says that like men can strike their wives, I was just wondering, like, an explanation that you have or an interpretation of that. Yeah. And why God had written that in the okay. When it comes to, for, for example, that particular verse, can you read it out, the whole verse? In English? Yeah. So, men are in charge of women by right. Can I have some of your water if you don't mind? So righteous women are totally obedient guarding the infant, not by the infant's absence, what Allah will have them guard. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them. But if they obey you once more, seek no means against them. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted in grant. Okay. Now, what would a feminist say to that? A feminist? Like, that men should be their wives? Yeah. Under any circumstances, they would say. Okay. And what does, if you look into the actual explanation of this verse, and you look into the explanation of what scholars say, they would say there are conditions in which a man can, is allowed to hit his wife, if this thing is followed. In 1400 years of Islamic history, this thing has been discussed. No one can deny this is in the Quran. Okay. Now, the the most, say, the most direct explanation that someone would give of this is if a woman is involved in behavior that is X, Y, Z, then so-and-so Islamic scholar has said that she, he's allowed to hit her with what's like a miswak or something, right? Any feminist would say this is misogynistic, this is wrong, this is not allowed. When you carry on reading Surah Nisa and you read the other verses and you read the other verses in the Quran about women, it will say a woman gets half the inheritance a man gets. This coupled with a woman getting half, an inher half the inheritance uh, that a man gets, again, what would they say? They would say Islam is a misogynistic religion, it's a patriarchal religion. When you combine that with the idea that in Islam a woman has to wear a hijab but a man doesn't, what would their answer to that be? That would be, again, this is oppressive. If we carry on along this, we can come across maybe seven, eight things like this. I want to answer all of them in one goal rather than one particular one. Islam says certain things which go against what men want and what women want. In both cases, the question that we have to ask is, why is Islam true? Because in Islam, one of the uh, things which men love to do, for example, is business. You're not allowed to take interest. The most precious thing to wear is gold. Men are not allowed to wear it. When you're married, the man has to spend his wealth on the woman, but the woman can take her wealth and not spend it on the man. When it comes to silk, which is the best cloth, a man can't wear it, but a woman can. When there's a war going on, like there is in Ukraine, when there is a war and the Khalifa says, you have to go to war, all the men have to fight, and if they die, they die, but the women don't have to fight. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, yep. but like, I have no issue with believing that Islam is true. And like, on, like, so my specific question is just that interpretation of the verse. Like, are men yep. actually allowed to beat their wives? And it, like, you know, is that okay? Yeah. According to that verse, according to the interpretation for the last 1400 years, with a, the, even the most liberal scholar will say, 
That is something undeniable in the Quran. They will say even with a miswak, but no one will say that doesn't exist. No one will. And any Muslim that tries to sugarcoat it and say this verse doesn't mean that, they're going to do mental gymnastics and they're never going to come to a conclusion. The reason why I couple this with a whole bunch of other things is they're all related to fundamentally the question, is Islam true? Because what's worse, having to die and possibly be tortured by your enemies or a man hitting his wife with a miswak? What's actually physically worse? Also, you know, you know, okay, no, sorry, let me just answer this. What's actually worse? I mean, I just think those are very different circumstances that you can't, like... No, cover. okay, what situation would you rather be in? I'm just talking about in terms of unfairness, because the root cause of these questions is there's something unfair in the text. That's the root cause, right? But the same unfairness can be applied to the man who says, I, can, I have to go to beyond the enemy lines and fight and possibly be captured and tortured, which is far worse than being hit by a miswak. So in Islam... But you said that's the most liberal interpretation. So what's the more strict one? Uh, okay. General point he was trying to make. The, the, okay. Yeah, let, 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 I know, but I'm... So, so, so yeah. what I mean by... I understand your so, point, what, what, saying, what, what yeah. I mean by liberal is not, not woke liberalism, because woke liberals will say that that's metaphorical, it doesn't exist. What I mean is... No one can deny that that's in the Quran. Yeah. No one can deny that's in the Quran. No one can deny for 1400 years, Islamic scholars have said this rule exists. Yeah. No one can deny that. That's what I actually meant. And the reason why I coupled this with a whole bunch of other things is to show there are things in Islam which cannot be rationalized unless you look into why Islam is true. Because you have a problem with this. Do you also have a problem with a woman getting half the inheritance that a man gets? I think that's different because like men are required to provide for their family. So that makes sense to me. But that doesn't make sense to a whole bunch of other women. Yeah, well I'm like that I, I because probably because they don't understand the larger context. But I don't know. Like to me But the what the okay, let me ask you a question. Like that actually okay, seems okay, fair to me. Okay. Like, men are required to provide okay, for their family. Okay, so let me let me let me ask you another way. If the Quran said that a woman if her husband doesn't do X, Y, Z, and say the husband's involved in extramarital affairs, he does this or that, the woman's allowed to hit the husband, and the woman gets um, double the inheritance that a man gets. Would you accept that that is right? If it says that in the Quran, if it's the other way around. I mean, so I have no, I have no issue with accepting that that's right. That's what I'm like, I have no issue with accepting that's right. I'm just wondering like what that actually means. All right, can I, can I just, you okay. know? No, sorry, let me just, let me just complete this point. The point I'm trying to get to sister is that the ultimate reason why any Muslim should yeah. accept those verses or any other verses is because they believe it's from God, not because they can rationalize it. Because there are many things in Islam which are rational but cannot be rationalized. Okay? So for example, in Islam, alcohol is not permitted. Interest is not permitted. We believe behind every ruling in Islam, there is a rationale, there is a wisdom. Now you've come to terms with the idea that women get half the inheritance of men because you've discovered the wisdom of it or you believe in the wisdom of it. In, in Islam, Allah tells us behind everything that he legislates, there is a wisdom. Sometimes we have access to the wisdom, sometimes we don't have access to the wisdom. The point is, we have to submit if we believe Islam to be true. Certain things cannot be rationalized. Sorry, let me just finish this conversation first. The point I'm trying to get to is, certain things in Islam cannot be rationalized. You have to go back into why Islam is true. Okay. Yeah. I get all of that. I'm just wondering specifically about that verse, like how, like you said, the most liberal interpretation is like, okay, like men can beat their wives in Islam, but like, how extreme does it go? Like, how much no, no. can they beat their wives no, no. and have it be? Oh, you no. know what I'm saying? Yeah, sister, listen, look, look, yeah. look and he, what do you mean meant, meant uh, by the, even the most liberal interpretation is that you can't deny it? And yeah. Uh, uh, so he's very like, unapologetic about it. Yes. We're not trying to try and sugarcoat it yeah. and say, oh, look, it doesn't really exist or this or that. But you know, there's some context here. I understand what you're saying. That yeah. you know, you're a Muslim. You believe in Islam. You understand what. And uh, Sabur pointed out there are wisdoms behind certain things, and there's contexts that we don't fully really always understand. Just one. Well, let me just add one thing to this. The context around the, even these wor verses being revealed, the Arabs before that used to beat their wives mercy, mer uh, without mercy. Initially, it was forbidden, totally. 
And what happened was that because it went totally 180, then a lot of the, 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 the people complained that How did it go totally 180? By saying, first they used to, you know, you have to understand, women's rights didn't exist before in Islam, before Islam came along, right? Even in inheritance. You know when uh, Muslim women were allowed to inherit half, a lot of people mocked Muslims. What do you mock Muslims? What, well, you're giving your women uh, inheritance rights? Things like that, right? With the, the beating verse, I want to be very specific and address this very specifically. Initially, the Arabs would beat their wives very aggressively, mercifully. And Islam came and said, no, that's wrong. But what happened is, in a society that's so used to that, where the men were so dominant in that way, that a lot of people complained, oh, hang on a minute, though, the, the, the women are born the other tree now, they're taking full advantage and, uh, and they're not able to manage and govern and so on. So what this came, when this verses came in, it, it came as a, a, a way to modernize, moderate. And when the beating of the miswak means that it's something so small and meaningless, it reduced it down, but there was always a threat there, or some sort of threat. Like slavery. We're not, Islam doesn't say it's good, right? But didn't outlaw it straight away. What happened? It discouraged it. And over time, what happened? It, it went, right? So there, there are certain wisdoms in the way that Islam came about. It, it, it's very practical. Yeah. Even with, so, with alcohol, it but, was phased over time. This is, this is just, uh, it was just, just to finish this point, that this is uh, the context of where yeah. these verses came about. You have to remember, look in history, why these verses were revealed, in what context were they revealed. Even now, in a lot of societies, where we spend a lot of time just now debating a guy who is uh, prom promoting matriarchy and how we should women are on top and men should be subservient to them. But all of these things, if you think about it, in most cultures, in most of the cultures we come from as well, you as women would not respect a man unless he's a man. So there is, there's a lot of different uh, contexts to speak about. Uh, and these were, yeah. verses were revealed in that particular and, context. And I want you to add something. The one who the Quran was revealed to understood it better than anyone, which is the Prophet. How many times did he beat his wives? Never. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the best of you are the best to their wives. Why was the criteria to be the best human being, the best to your wife? Because you can act really nice in front of society. You can act really nice in front of your friends and family, but your real character is only known by your spouse. So Islam doesn't say wife beatings good and do it. This particular verse is for extreme circumstances. The Prophet, peace be upon him, never did it. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he had a woman come to him and the woman wanted to inquire about marriage proposals that she had, the Prophet discouraged her from marrying this guy because he was stingy, this guy because he was a wife beater. So Islam doesn't encourage wife beating. Islam doesn't encourage um, violence against women. This particular verse has to be understood in that context. And the way I see it is this particular verse for most women I think for most men, even liberal men, not, not men in the past, but liberal men today, it cannot be rationalized. It simply has to be accepted if they go back to where it came from and they look at the context of it. Because there's many things in Islam, sisters, not just this. There's many things in Islam which can make someone leave Islam unless they go back to why Islam is true. So I'll tell you the story of one of my friends. One of my friends converted to Islam and he came from an egalitarian background, a liberal background. He found out that in Islam, a woman cannot seek divorce. She can only get khula. She can't say talaq, talaq, talaq and get rid of her husband like the man can. There's an asymmetry there. And what happened was, this made him doubt Islam because he's a convert and he was brought up in a liberal feministic sort of way. After marriage, he discovered, actually, I see a wisdom behind this. Whatever wisdom he discovered, he discovered. So sometimes these things are tests from Allah. They actually test from Allah to see whether we believe. And this is why the question always goes back to, why is Islam true? What did I do with the, the guy who's here before you? I'm not interested in the, all the questions that he has. I'm interested in showing him why God exists and why Quran is true. Because once we can know that Islam is true, it answers all these questions. Which is why I brought up the, this question of all the other things. Because there are a lot of things in Islam which are gender biased, which are not equal. 
Islam is not an egalitarian religion. I think a, a lot of Muslims brought up in the West, because we're brought up with liberalism and we're brought up with Islam, it's very hard for us to understand how do we reconcile the two. And my answer is we don't have to reconcile the two because liberalism's wrong. It's, it's, it's actually pretty simple. It's actually harder to try and marry Islam to liberalism and reinterpret these verses in a woke way because I could have said to you, that's metaphorical and left it there. But that's not telling you the truth. You see? Make sense? Try, try, try reading tafsir. Yeah. Any verse you don't quite understand fully, find a tafsir you like. And then nowadays it's so easy you can go online and, and look at the tafsir uh, explanation of those verses. Well, I mean, like, that's what you were saying, though, is that sometimes you'll just never understand the wisdom behind it. Which is, like, I guess I have a lot of questions about the wisdom behind some commandments. And, like, I don't, like, this... Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's where the seed will come in. That what yeah. you often find is that some Muslims are explained, not everything, yeah. but some are explained. There are some ahadith that Rasulullah yeah. gave you some ahadith, some context behind it. Right? You'll get some of these explanations through the seed, the commentary. You see? For example, when we look at interest, well, interest may not mean a lot to, to you perhaps. It does to a lot of Muslim men who are into business, who are into, like, it's, it's a massive constraint economically, especially if you live in the West. You can't get a house on mortgage, you can't get a finance on mortgage, you can't start a business on mortgage. What is the wisdom behind that? We'll find out on the Day of Judgment. What is the wisdom behind the fact that in Islam, a man is given authority over a woman? Now, nobody can say that Surah Nisa doesn't say that. It does say that. It's the beginning of the verse that men are the maintainers and protectors of women. It doesn't say they're equal partners. Now, that doesn't mean that one oppresses the other, but it does mean that one has authority over the other. And in Islam, for example, the Khalifa, the head of state, here in the UK, the prime minister can be a man, a woman, nowadays anyone in between. But in Islam, the Khalifa has to be a man. All the prophets were men. Now, someone can turn around and say, this is wrong, this is patriarchal, this is not in line with 21st century wokeism. And we could say, yeah, that's fine. But what's the evidence that Islam is true? Here's the evidence. Therefore, we follow it. Look, Islam's not a religion of fashion. Islam's a religion of tradition. It's a religion which dates back hundreds of years. And it's a religion there with a divine origin. So it's not going to fit woke liberal ideologies. If you were brought up in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, this, this question would not even come to you. The reason why it's come to me and you and us is because we're brought up here in the West. So we have to understand a lot of the time they're battling opposite ideologies and we don't need to. We just need to drop the other ideologies and wholeheartedly understand that Islam is the paradigm. It's not a paradigm that needs to match up to others. And I, yeah, I mean, I accept that. Yeah. Also, this is just another question. I guess it's not... I don't know if you would want to answer this or if you have time, but you brought up slavery and how like Islam kind of phased it out. But like I'm just wondering if there is any room, like if someone wanted to bring back slavery right now, is Islam okay? With, like is that okay? Is that okay? So I, I think it was Bin Baz who was asked this question. Was it Bin Baz or Uthaymin? One of the scholars was asked about there was um, there was a conflict. And he was being asked about this and he said, no, that's been, that's finished. And someone, um, I'd need someone who has more knowledge on this to, uh, to verify this. But I remember there was an opinion about a recent conflict in which slaves could have been taken and the scholar said, no. Now, let me just explain something very important. There is zero slavery in Islam. Okay. Slavery is zero rights. What happened in America when they were t the transatlantic slave trade and in, and in Europe, they took these people, they killed them, they butchered them, they raped them, they slaved them, uh, they mutilated them, they gave them no rights. A slave by definition has no rights. Islam doesn't have slavery. Islam has something which is different, which is best to describe as bonded servants. Bonded servants. So I'll explain something. In the Quran it says, if a slave wants their freedom, and they want to work towards their freedom, give it to them. That's in the Quran. And in the Quran and the Prophet told us, treat people justly. The Prophet told us that the slaves should be eating the food that we're eating and they're wearing the clothes that we're wearing. That's not slavery. And also, 
there was a man that hit a slave. He hit a slave. He felt bad. He went to the Prophet. And the repercussion for hitting the slave was the slave was freed. This is not slavery. Islam has something different to it. And Islam encourages freeing of slaves and the right treatment of these people. So whenever we look at slaves, we think of what happened in the transatlantic slave trade. You cannot compare that to what happened. You know the Prophet's uncle Abbas, right? The Prophet's uncle Abbas. At one point he was a slave and he was freed. So we have to understand slavery in Islam is, is a term which is used quite loosely. There's slavery in Islam. But I challenge anyone to show there's ever been one slave in Islam. Because a slave by definition has no rights in the Quran and the Prophet say that slaves have rights. In fact, there's something really interesting. The Prophet forbade Muslims from saying my slave man or my slave girl because the Prophet said you're all slaves of God. So the, there's actually authentic narration of the Prophet where he said, do not say my slave girl or my slave boy, right? Um, what's the name of that guy in America who wrote a book on Islam and slavery? That, um, Islam and the, slavery. The revert guy, Jonathan, Jonathan something. Brown. Jonathan Brown. There's a, what's his book called? Basically, it's Google Jonathan this book Brown. called Jonathan Brown. This book is written about slavery. I haven't read it. I heard it's very good, just letting you know. Um, but these nuances are really important because no one had this 1400 years ago. Just another question about that. Um, like, what is, like, what is the wisdom or like, what are the param parameters around men having intercourse with their female slaves in Islam? I believe that's covered in the book. I believe that's covered and, in the book. Know, in, in, again, you know, a lot of these things were... You have to, you have to put in a, you know, a lot of your questions. It really helped try and understand the context in which Islam came, how the pre-Islamic uh, Arabia was, and the world was really. It put a lot of context. Even with that, Islam put rules down. So hang on a minute. You have to marry the slave, or there are rights to get a pregnant, etc., etc. There, there are certain things in there. Well, I suppose your, your wider question would be: Why not just uh, outright forbid everything? Right? To make everything even like, I don't think that men had to marry. There's like they could just freely have intercourse. No, there were rights. There were rights. Were, there were given. Before that, there were no rights. They could do what you want. You treat them like absolute property, like cattle. But there were rights given. No, you can't do that. But then there are certain things that are again, if in that context, in that society, in that time, it was very different. But it's, what Islam did was, it didn't just, it, the whole of slavery, they didn't just abolish it straight away. So, no, it's all haram, that's it. Because they said society would collapse, it would have collapsed on itself. Again, it Islam is... Okay, so, uh, with their so, 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 uh, no, no, let, 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 let me explain to you how, okay, let me explain to you how ancient warfare worked. Ancient warfare was all about reproduction is a uh, battlefield for success. So what would happen is two tribes would fight each other. The women from these tribes, all their husbands would be dead. So you wouldn't just leave them. They would be taken by the other tribes and assimilated into that tribe. This was ancient times. Persia, Rome, China, India, everyone was doing the same thing. So what Islam said, it came and regulated that. It regulated that. It didn't ban it. It regulated it. Now someone could turn around today and say, I think the best thing would have been that Muslims just refuse to engage in slavery at all and let the other empires engage in them and they had greater reproductive success from a purely sociological perspective Islam would be at a massive disadvantage on the battlefield so these things look sometimes it's very hard to understand objectively but in warfare a lot of, a lot of the early times there was no states there was no borders everything in the beginning was the age of empires it was to do with warfare and Reproduction was one of the fastest ways to replenish your troops, which is why people that could reproduce faster, they actually won greater land, they won greater territory, they had greater empires. It was a different universe. That's why a lot of those things today, when we try and understand them, we cannot understand them because the context has disappeared. Well, so then that's my question. Like, if someone wanted to bring it back, like, technically, like, what, what in Islam is there that would, like, prohibit that? Okay, so in Islam, the Prophet taught us the scholars are the inheritors of the Prophets. So for example, I'm not a scholar. If I say something, I have to find it in the Quran, in the sayings of the Prophet, 
all the consensus of the first three generations of Muslims. That's it. That is Islam. So what we find is that if there's a contemporary problem today, say the war in Bosnia, during this conflict, female slaves could have been taken. But there was an Islamic scholar who's asked, and I think it was, his name was Bin Baz or Uthaymin. I don't remember which one of those scholars it was. He was asked, are we allowed to take female slaves? And, and the scholar said, no, because that's finished. That was in the past. So if, the, to answer your question, can we bring slavery back? Well, according to scholars who are inheritors of the prophets, the answer is no. Yeah, you have like councils of scholars, thick councils and all sorts. What they in Islam, because it's a, it's a living religion, each time society adapts to it. So the, the, the scholars yeah. all have inherited, they, that's why they're the inheritors of the prophets, because they who you turn to for guidance yeah. and who will have the understanding in the full context. And there'll and never be, sense. yeah, and there'll never be a consensus of Muslim scholars upon falsehood. Yeah. You can always have one guy randomly saying X, Y, Z. But a consensus of the scholars will never be upon falsehood. Yeah. Thank you. No what were your guys' names? Sabur. Sabur Hassan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are you guys from the States? Yeah, we are. I just want to... Which city are you from? I'm from Minneapolis. I find, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way at all. I've spent a lot of time at Speaker's Corner and I speak to people regularly. British Muslims don't really have these questions as much as American Muslims do. And I just wanted to ask you a question about this. Generally, when I find American Muslims, they are a lot more liberal than the Muslims here. Do you have the same experience? I mean, I've only been in London for like two -ish days and I haven't interacted with a lot of Muslims here, but like, I, I, yeah, so I actually can't answer your no, question. No, no, I'm asking about America. In oh, the United but States. compared to Muslims in London, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to interact with that many Muslims okay. in London. Okay. But, but I don't know. I, I, I think, I think, I think, I think they're, they're, in the United States, uh, you guys, are, uh, the Muslim community especially, they've, they've, they're in, in the American society, they're very cleverly linked minorities all onto the Democratic side, the left. Leaning yeah. the liberal side because they said, Oh, these Republicans and these the right, and they were all like, Oh, it's yeah. not us. And therefore, I think maybe because of that, it's a lot of cultural influence. On the I also think it's because when you look, for example, here in London, we have Chinatown with Chinese people, we have Gold is Green with Jewish people, we have East London with lots of Muslims. I think in America, the Muslims are scattered all over the place. And that weakens the Muslim identity, it weakens the Muslim confidence, it weakens the ability of Muslims to articulate themselves. Because this pattern, I've seen it for so many years that I don't believe it's, it's something that has no basis. So I was trying to figure out what is the actual cause. My, my understanding is because the Muslims in America seem to be, because America is so big, they don't seem to have a strong community in one, whole, in one area. They all seem to be thinned out in different places. Yeah, I mean, it could be. I feel like geographically, like, Europe is just closer to the homeland, I guess. The homelands of Islam, yeah. yeah. So like, Morocco is down the corner, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Around the corner, right? Uh, yeah. Algeria, Egypt, yeah. Libya, yeah. Bosnia. Yeah. Bosnia is in Europe. That could possibly be the case, yeah. You, you, you know, um, I, I, I recommend, you know, you guys, you guys are from the United States. There's three scho uh, scholars uh, in... in uh, in the United States, I particularly recommend, especially for you, listening to your questions, that I, I find the explanations very good. One is Dr. Yasser Qadi. Yeah. You know, right? Have a look at his explanations. He's got a lot of videos online as well. Anything you type.